Have you ever looked at a herd of cows? You see this whole flock of cows, you know, all female, with one bull. You know, and the bull lords it over everyone. Well, he doesn't really lord it over them in the sense of the cows do what they want. But you see, once in a while they feel like, well, you see, like meeting the bull. And, um, and then they do. It's not that the bull forces them into anything, you know, they just follow nature. And otherwise, you see the bull, you know, he can show off to everyone, look, this is my herd, but that herd doesn't really feel anything of, of the bull, except that its cows are the bull's children. But, um, you know, they do what they want. And to some extent, in fact, that is the patriarchal human society, because for a very long time, women who were subordinate, so to speak, nevertheless, had little to do with men. They had their own society, and once in a while, of course, you know, uh, husband and wife came together um, for pleasure or, or sometimes to discuss household matters, you know, about household money, about how the children have to be raised. But otherwise, most of the time, their lives were separate. And the man was rarely at home. He was at work, then he went to his club, you know, went, you know, sporting with his friends and, and so on. And sometimes, yes, having a fling on the side, I admit. But um, nevertheless, their lives were separate. And so, you know, in those days, patriarchy was not that oppressive. Huh? So, I mean, a whole lot of what is said about patriarchy is, is a bit overdone and is a bit projecting the modern world onto the ancient world. Because now men and women meet each other all the time. They go to the same school, which used to be different. They went to separate schools. Uh, you know, they can have the same jobs, which also used to be different. You had female nurses and male doctors. And um, so there was, in that case, they met each other in the hospital, but there was a clear role division. There was no rivalry between them. There was no confusion at all. And so now, in that sense, life is more difficult, more demanding. And so some of the modern situations are projected onto the ancient ones, then to come to the conclusion, oh, this ancient society must have been terrible. Well, not always. So it's a bit overdone. Uh, at the same time, of course, I, I see what you're talking about. And um, so, you know, in a way, I mean, I am used to a society where um, women become surgeons or, you know, presidents or whatever. And I mean, I have, I'm comfortable with that, you see. Now, um, India, of course, has the distinction of uh, being among the first to have a woman prime minister. It's about time that they have a second go at it, I think, by now. But, um, or Bangladesh, even a Muslim country, has the distinction of being the first country where two women politicians take turns at being prime minister. Look at that. You see, America can't even dream of it. Um, so, uh, that says something about the mentality of the Indian people. And um, so... You, you don't find many queens in Indian history, not like Queen Elizabeth and Queen Victoria. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Hindu society is much less uh, hostile to and oppressive of <coughs> women than, well, some others that I could name. Uh, at the same time, of course, it is true that the Shastras don't know of any equality. Uh, you know, you have you have separate role divisions that are taken for granted. Men have all kinds of different roles according to what they do in the day. And women all have the same role in the sense of they have to provide children to each of those groups of men. And um, so that is the division. You know, women look after the children and men do the rest. Uh, while the rest, no, women also do the cleaning and so on. But, I mean, women do their thing and men do their thing. You see, that, that, 
That was true in Hindu society, no doubt about it. And if that's what you call patriarchal, well, of course, Hindu society was patriarchal, and so was biblical society, and so was Quranic society, and other societies you can name. So in that sense, there's nothing special about uh, Hindu society. Now, let's highlight a few examples here. Um, last year, there has been a debate about um, so-called reparation marriage, which means that uh, a woman is raped and then the perpetrator is set free on condition of marrying the victim. Now, that existed in many societies, that practice. Like uh, in Italy, it uh, was abolished only 20, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. <clears throat> After a famous such case was challenged by the woman concerned. And, um, but so you can see that this thing is in flux. It's changing in Europe, it's changing in India too. In India, in India, you see this reparation marriage is provided for in the Shastras. You know, so-called Rakshasa marriages and Pisacha marriages, what are they about? You see, if a woman is forced into marriage either by abduction or by intoxication. Hmm? Yet, you see, those situations are recognized as marriage for a very good reason. Um, namely, in that society, which was indeed very patriarchal, such a victim could hardly return to her family. You see, she would be, she would be covered with shame. She would be treated as a dishonorable, as a bad woman all her life. Often, you see, the only road she had in life was to become the keep of some rich man, some his backstreet girl, but at least taken care of, or otherwise as a prostitute. And so, to avoid that, she could also marry her rapist. And so then, you know, she would at least formally be correct. It would be premarital sex, but it would not be illegal because a marriage followed on it. Mm. And then, you know, she would have the honor of being the mother of the grandchildren of her parents-in-law. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you see the, the honor of her family would be restored. Her siblings would not appear on the marriage market as damaged because from a dishonored family and so on. So in that society, you know, it was understandable because a number of um, negative consequences were avoided or minimized. Nevertheless, I can imagine that it must not be uh, fun to, uh, to stay married all your life to the man you know as your rapist. So it's a good thing, it's a very good thing that this has evolved, you see, that this has changed, um, among other reasons, because our appreciation of the role of men and women has changed. The um, avenues in life for a woman have much improved like the access of women to the full labor market. Uh, so that all is a good thing, and it's of course a very sorry thing that among Indian Muslims, apparently, these, uh, these situations still exist. But even there, I must report some progress. In uh, many Muslim countries too, this reparation marriage has been abolished. Yeah. Recently in Jordan, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and so uh, I guess the Indian Muslim community should uh, follow suit <clears throat> and grow out of it. And then the other, I was giving, going to give a few examples. Yeah. Well, the other example that is mentioned all the time is sati. Now, sati is already a practice from the past. Nevertheless, it is still always brought up. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there, the, the picture is uh, pretty more nuanced or has rather different implications than what is usually thought of. Um, first of all, if you want to have a, uh, an India with many different faces, like the secularists always want, <coughs> a vibrant India, um, then, um, then you should appreciate that the existence of Sati is one of the many forms that life can take. Hey, you see, if you think that many religions should coexist, well then, you see, why not the conviction that uh, a widow 
should follow her husband on his uh, funeral pyre. Okay? Uh, well, you see, I don't think, therefore, that sati is a good thing, but I think they, those who advocate multiculturalism, should accept that this is the implication of multiculturalism. Yes. This is the implication of multiculturalism. Um, so, uh, nevertheless, uh, though you see I globally think it's a good thing that, um, that sati was phased out, as the Vedic Rishis already thought, because the very first description of a sati is in the Rig Veda, and there the woman is dissuaded from committing sati. She is led away from the funeral pyre. No sati. She is enjoined to join the living. Let the dead go. You see, come back to the society of the living. <clears throat> that is the ugly, vicious, brahminical Hindu view of sati. Okay, but in some martial castes like the Rajputs, indeed you see sati is a long tradition. And they glorified it and they sanctified it and they have these sati styles. Um, so yes, you see it was there. And um, you know, it's a good thing that it has phased out among them too for the very reason that the Rishis also gave to it. You see, it's, it's not a healthy thing to join the dead. This is the world of the living. You too, even as a widow, you too have a place in the world of the living. <clears throat> the avenues for widows, by the way, have also changed. You see, they now can remarry and so on. This was not always the case. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's just not right from a, from a yogic perspective, where you know, self-control is so important, calmness is important, that you take such a momentous decision as taking your own life in the fire in a moment uh, of emotion. You see, when, when, your, when your husband dies, that is, a mo that is one of the most emotional moments in your life. If at the moment of such emotions you take an irrational decision, well, that is deplorable, that should be avoided. And so it's a good thing that Sati has ended. And Hindu society has done its own bit to end it. Uh, so, you know, it won't do to, uh, to keep on accusing Hindu society of committing this, uh, this sati or of forcing women into sati. Because there also the, the historical facts are not usually represented correctly. It is assumed that women were forced into sati. That is not true. There are cases of a man having several wives where the wives quarrel among each other for the honor of joining him in, on the funeral pyre. You see, so women had to be dissuaded from committing sati because often they wanted to. Now, some of them, of course, also repented once they fell to flames. And so you have cases of women who interrupt their own sati and try to, you know, jump off the pyre. Mm. And then they were often forced back on because the family thought it was inauspicious to start some religious ritual and then interrupt it. So this also happened. So there are cases of forced sati. This is true. Generally, it was definitely not. And so the problem with sati for modern intellectuals is that they force you to, in, to accept that there are very different views of the place of death in human life. Some people have a very different attitude to death than is now condoned. Mm.